Hey, thank you very much. It's, it's absolutely an honor to be back here with you guys tonight. I, I love our men's ministry at the church. I just just cherish time with you guys. There's a piece of business we got to take care of starting out. You all have this, uh, this piece of paper on your tables. It's called the Eternal Life Bill. And what I want you to do is I want everybody, this is really important for tonight. I want you to get this Eternal Life Bill, and I want you to put your name on it right here. I've got my name, Robert R. Cost, because this, this plays a real pivotal uh, thing in, in, in what we're doing and what we're doing here tonight. It, I, I just can't tell you how important that is. Fill that out really quick. I'd appreciate it. And I'm going to get my uh, get my clock up here, and we will be we'll be set to go here in just a second. There we go. Okay, um, let's let's go ahead and start and let's go ahead and start in prayer tonight. Okay, Lord, I thank you so much for today, and I thank you for uh, these precious men that are here tonight, Lord. I just um, I just pray you bless our time here today. Uh, I pray that you help us to be able to concentrate on your word. Uh, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you'll teach us that you speak to our inner man and who we are and that you'll change us from the inside out. In your name I pray, amen. amen. Several years ago, I came across a story about the 21-year-old son of a European ambassador. And it was, it was really interesting. Uh, this 21-year-old, this uh, he was driving his car and he ran over a woman and he killed her. And when he was, when he was charged with murder, he claimed diplomatic immunity uh, because his dad was an ambassador. And come to find out in the 30 months before that, this young man had been arrested four other times, and all four times he claimed diplomatic immunity, and the charges were dropped because of, because of the privileged position that his father held. Uh, this young man uh, cannot be, cannot be uh, brought to judgment in the United States for his offenses, because he has something called diplomatic immunity. Uh, what's, what's really interesting is the religious folks of Paul's time, they were Jewish people. They were, they were the Jews. That was the primary, uh, primary religious people that you had. And what happened was they thought that they had some type of diplomatic immunity uh, from, from coming to God the way that everybody else had to come to God. They thought, they thought that they, they, had a, they had it in with God because of their pedigree because of their Jewish heritage. Well, today uh, we have similar religious groups. One of the biggest religious groups are people that call themselves Christians. And, and in fact, our, our churches are filled with Christians. And, and what's really interesting about our churches today is that church researchers and pastors uh, have, have come to the conclusion that at least 50% of the people that attend a Christian church are not saved. They, 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 have, they do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is not the Lord of their life. They have not accepted Jesus as Savior. They seem to think that they have diplomatic immunity from having faith in Jesus Christ alone in order for, in order for them to be saved. Um, and in, what's really interesting is in Romans chapter 3 and verses 1 through 8, a Paul, he addresses he addresses the Jews, and he's kind of addressing the religious people of the day. We start out in verse 1, and it says, Then, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in this ceremony of circumcision? So Paul starts out, you think he's going to make a list, and he says, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there, is there any, what, what about the circumcision thing? And then he gets, to, he gets to verse 2, and he says, Yes, there are benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. Now, this is a big deal. The whole revelation of God is the word of God. They were entrusted with that. And just like the Jews were entrusted with the word of God, so are we. We're Christians. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're entrusted with the Bible. You're entrusted with the entire Bible, the Old and the New Testament. I tell you, just like the Jews are entrusted with it, so are we. The problem is, is that we live in a world today where the glory of God has, of his word has, has, lost its, has lost its importance to people. My question to you is how do you regard the, regard the word of God today, man? How do you regard the word of God today in your life? Job in Job 23, 12, Job said, I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth 
more than my necessary food. Now that, that's interesting because to Job, the most important thing to him was the word of God. It was more important than his food. Job had been going through terrible times. I mean, by the time you get to chapter 23, he's lost his family. He's lost almost, there, almost everything he owns. And his good friends are giving him a hard time saying that God's trying to get back at you for something. He's got boils on his skin. He's got pus coming out everywhere. The guy's in bad shape. And he still says, I still treasure the word of God. To Job, the word of God was more important than his Kentucky Fried Chicken. It was more important than his Mexican food. It was more important than enchiladas, chimneys, New York steak, lobster, veggies, and donuts. It was the most important thing to him. Is the word of God your life-sustaining source today? Is the word of God your life-sustaining source today? It sustains me every day. I get up in the morning, and, and I've been doing this for the last eight years. I, I do this thing called the Bible in one year. Uh, my mentor, he got me into doing this eight years ago. He said, you got to start doing the Bible in one year. And so I get up in the morning, and, and I'm sitting on the throne. You know what I'm talking about? And, 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 I'm, and I'm reading the Bible in one year. And this year, I'm doing it with one of the brothers here in our men's group. And we're doing it about the same time every day. And we text back and forth as we're sitting on the throne in the morning. And we encourage. And we're sending verses back and forth to each other. And it sustains us. This word of God, it, it's... This is, my, this is my first year being fatherless. My dad died last year. And so this is, this is, this is dad's dad, daddy, my, my God, my Lord, my God. This is his letter to me. And I read it every morning and, and it does sustain me. Is that how the word of God is for you? In this passage, the Jews are hooked on their own human reason instead of admitting the need for God in the scriptures to make them acceptable. They, they have resorted to their own false religion made up of emotional reasoning of man and not the reasoning of God. Romans 3.3 3 says, true, some of them were unfaithful. But just because they were unfaithful, does that mean that God will be unfaithful? In other words, since some of the Jews are unfaithful, and they're supposedly God's people, does that mean that, that God is unfaithful? Paul says, of course not, in verse 4. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. You got that? Paul says, absolutely not. God is always faithful, no matter what, regardless of us. God is always faithful, because that's one of the characteristics of him. Then Paul quoted scripture, the scripture from Psalm 51.4. It's interesting because that passage comes when David, when David's friend Nathan has confronted him about an adulterous, murderous relationship that he had with Bathsheba, and he had her husband killed. And David, rather than, than denying his sin and, and calling God a liar, David confesses his sin, admits that he has done wrong, and he is in need of forgiveness. That's what David does. My friend, do you deal with your sin by owning it admitting to it and confessing it to God. In verse 5 of Romans chapter 3, Paul poses another question. But some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. If we sin and look so bad, this is what they're saying, if we sin and we look so bad, it makes God look so good because I'm so bad. Does this mean that God is unrighteous because he inflicts pain on us? Paul answers in Romans 3, 6, of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? Paul says, no way. God is the judge, period, because only he is God. Paul poses another question in verses 7 and 8. But some might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness? and brings him more glory. And some people even slander us by claiming that we say, the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be, a, be condemned. So in these first eight verses, he's giving all the reasons that the Jews use to justify their sin, to stay the way that they are. You know what? You cannot justify your sin in any way. Man is 100% incapable of justifying his sin in any way. That, 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 that just can't happen. And then we, and then, so, so here we are. 
In the first three chapters of Romans, Paul has been acting like a prosecuting attorney. In the first chapter, Paul prosecutes the Gentile. In the second chapter, Paul prosecutes, prosecutes pagan moralizers. And in chapter 3 of the first eight verses, Paul prosecutes the religious folks. He's prosecuting the Jews, and he's kind, kind of talking to church attenders in those first eight verses. Now, starting in verse 9, Paul basically says, we're all in the same boat. It doesn't matter, matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile or whatever you are. We're all kind of in the same boat. In verse 9, he says, Well, then, should we conclude that we Jews are better off than others? Not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. Do you get that? Everybody's under the power of sin. You may think to yourself, well, at least I'm better than some others. At least in God's sight I am. I'm not as bad as Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer or that drunk down the street that beats up on his wife. But according to that verse, you are under the power of sin, period. You got it? You are a sinner, so shut up, quit reasoning and comparing in your mind, and admit that you are guilty. All are condemned under sin. To show us just how unrighteous we are, Paul quotes Psalm 53 in verses 10 through 12. As the scripture says, No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. In, the verse, in verses 10 through 12, Paul keeps using the phrase, No one, and he uses it five times. Man is not capable of doing what is right on his own in the sight of God. Men are unreasonable. Apart from God, man cannot understand spiritual things and be wise. Man does not seek after God on his own. Man has gone and done his own thing. Apart from God, it is not good what man does. Apart from God, man on his own is totally depraved. That's what he is. It's called complete depravity. That's how man is when he is on his own. No matter what tries to well, no, no matter what man tries to do on his own, he is in no way acceptable to God. In verses 13 through 18, the conduct of the totally deprived man is described. Notice how this conduct covers every aspect of the man, the mind, the emotions, sexuality, conscious, and will. Verses 13 and 14 describes wicked words of the depraved man. Verse 13, their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. It's the words that men use apart from God. Verses 15 through 18, it describes the wicked ways of man. Verse 15, they rush to commit murder. That's so true. When, when I look around today, I, I, look about, I look at what's going on in this country. Uh, men, grown men, not just grown men, but a lot of people in this country are rushing to kill innocent babies. It's called abortion, right? They got so mad when the Supreme Court said, no, we aren't going to regulate this at a federal level. They went crazy. What even surprises me more is states are passing laws that says even after the baby is born, even after the baby is born, you can still murder this baby. That's what it really is killing the baby after it has been born. So people are rushing, people are rushing to kill. Romans 3, 10, 17 says, I'm sorry, 3, 16 says, destruction and misery always follow them. That's so true. Destruction and misery follows them. All you have to do is look around at the destruction and misery all around us. Divorces, drugs, murder, homosexuality. We're at a point now to where our government is encouraging gender change of children. I, I mean, that, that, that's about as far as you can go in depravity. Babies and children, they're pretty innocent. At, at least leave the babies and the children alone. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's where we have landed now. And so man, he is just completely miserable. Verse 17, 317 says, they do not know where to find peace. Man is totally depraved on his own. 
I was reading an article over the weekend about a man up in Canada that he had had a sex change operation done on him some time ago. He was looking for peace in his life. And now, and now this man, he's applying for assisted suicide because he regrets his decision so much of what he did. It, it, it's really sad, isn't it? The man didn't find peace. The only peace that you're ever going to find is in Jesus Christ, is in God. In verse 318 it says, they have no fear of God at all. The lack of fearing God eliminates the possibility of any right relationship with God. Verse 19 says, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Man is found guilty of sin because the law points to our sinfulness. That was the purpose of the law. It was to show us our sinfulness and to show us our need for another way. When you realize that you are completely guilty and you are completely deprived, you have, and you have, have absolutely no chance of being good enough to earn your way to heaven by keeping the law, you simply need another way. You need another way to justify your sin. You need diplomatic immunity from the eternal consequences of your sin. That's what you need. You need diplomatic immunity from the consequences of your sin. You need what verse 21 is talking about. This is the good news. But God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. You got that? Verse 21 says that God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. This is really important. God has shown us a way to diplomatic immunity from our sins, a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? We don't have to keep the requirements of the law. God has found a way, and he's given us a way to have this diplomatic immunity how do we get this immunity? Look down at verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. This is incredible. Everyone is eligible for diplomatic immunity from the law, which means that you are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Everyone is eligible for diplomatic immunity from the law which means that you are made right with God by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. This immunity is available to everyone who believes, no matter who we are. This is so important. When Some years ago, I was up at a camp, and I was a pastor up at a camp, and I, and, I was, and I was the guy who was preaching every night to the kids and doing Bible study with, with these kids up at this camp. And, and this one night I got done, and I heard a ton of noise. It sounded like a big party was going on, and I couldn't figure out what was happening. I heard these girls, it, just, it was just crazy. It went on all night. It was so loud that I couldn't sleep very well because they were so noisy. So I get up the next morning, I'm standing in the chow line, and, and these two girls, they have these party hats on. You know the ones I'm talking about? The cones that are upside down, and they all had those things where you blow, and they go in and out and stuff like that. And I asked, what happened? And they told me, these two girls, they, they were pastor's kids, and they were twins. And they told me that they had been holding out all of these years and coming to Christ because they thought they had another way because their dad was a pastor. And it was that night they had a birthday party because they became born again. Just incredible. How do we get this immunity? It's by faithing, by, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the first step in receiving this diplomatic immunity is to realize verse 23. For everyone has sinned, we fall short of God's glorious standard. For everyone has sinned, and we fall short of God's glorious standard. The first step in receiving this gift of diplomatic immunity is to admit that you are a sinner. That's the first step. You have to admit that you are a sinner. You know why? It tells us in that verse that everyone is sin, no matter who you are. Everyone is a sinner. 
When I think of Romans 3.23, I think of the I think of archery. In archery, you have this target. And what they'll do is they'll keep moving this target out further and further and further on the archery range. Now imagine that target that you're shooting at is God's glorious standard. But that target isn't 100 or 200 yards away. That target's like 2,000 yards away. And nobody, no matter who you are, no matter how big of a bow you have, or no matter how strong you are, you're not going to be able to sling that arrow far enough to hit that target. That arrow is going to fall short. And that's how it is for mankind. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's how it is. Verse 24, Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Isn't that amazing? In verse 24, the being made right is known as being justified. Being justified, being freed or emancipated from our sin, is the biggest thing to ever happen in the history of man. Being justified, being freed or emancipated from our sin, is the biggest thing to ever happen in the history of man. How is this diplomatic immunity purchased? How is this diplomatic immunity paid for? Look at verse 20, look at verse 25. But, but let me warn you of something about verse 25, the first part of it. This is the biggest thing that has ever happened in the history of man. Okay? We're in entering territory. This is the most powerful thing that has ever happened. Okay? In fact, in the first... In the first chapter of Romans, Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. He wasn't ashamed to tell anybody in any situation, no matter what it was, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we get here, and, and we, arrive, we arrive at this verse, and, 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 and we get started here in verse 25, and it says, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God, when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Jesus, being God himself, presented himself as the sacrifice for our sin. That's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus, being God himself, presented himself as a sacrifice for our sin. We pick up in John chapter 19, verse 30. We pick up where Jesus Christ is hanging, nailed on the cross. Jesus Christ, he is in the process of paying the penalty for our sin. As the final sin is being paid, John writes in, in, in chapter 19, verse 30, he states, he said, Jesus Christ, he said, to telestai, meaning it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. This word to telestai it is so incredibly important because Jesus Christ said, it is finished. When Jesus Christ said it was finished, at that moment, it was finished. Everything we needed to have, everything we needed to have, Jesus took care of it in order to be forgiven for all of our sins, past, present, and future. I mean, this is the biggest moment in mankind. This is bigger than man landing on the moon. This is bigger than the fall of the wall in Berlin. This is bigger than any war that has happened. This is the biggest, most powerful thing that has ever happened. In fact, I can tell you tonight that the most powerful thing in the universe is the gospel of Christ. That's the most powerful thing in the universe. It's God's message to us, and it's a message of love. That's his message to us, the most powerful thing in the universe. And what's interesting is you, is you read on, you read on, Jesus says to tell us that his vision is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Jesus finishes paying for our sins with his blood. Everything was paid in full. This is the biggest moment in history. And then we get more detail in Matthew chapter 27. What happens next is very powerful, legendary, the biggest moment in history. Then Jesus shouted again to tell us die. That's in John chapter 19, verse 30. And he released the spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. I mean, do you get what's going on here? I mean, do you understand this? I mean, here we are. 
Jesus Christ, he dies and he says to Telestai, it's finished. And at that moment, this curtain in the sanctuary, it was torn in two. It was torn in two. The curtain was torn in two. They call it the veil. And what the veil was, the veil was this very thick curtain. I think it was about this thick. And what they did with the veil was it separated sinful man from the presence of God. And what they would do is they would take the priest. The priest would go in there to offer up incense and do ceremonial things in the presence of God. And before he would go in there, they would take a rope and they would tie it around his leg. Because sometimes the priest would go in there and there was something that wasn't right about him and he would fall down dead and they'd have to pull him out of there with the rope. You know it, don't you, brother? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They drag him right out. See that brother says they were dragging him right out. And at the moment that Jesus Christ said to Telestai, it is finished, that was torn in two. And that man at that very moment, that man had direct access to God at that very moment. But it goes further. I mean, you have earth, the earth is shaking. You have great earthquakes. You have rocks being split apart. Tombs are being opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died, they were raised from the dead. I mean, this is amazing. You have people that were dead coming out of the graves. They're coming out of the tombs. When I think about this, I think about what if you were in New Orleans at the time? I mean, all those tombs, right? All those caskets, they're above ground, you know? I mean, you got all these people coming back to life. They're knocking the lids off of them, and they're walking. And believers that have been buried and they were dead, they're coming to life because this is the most powerful moment that ever happened in the history of mankind. This is the most powerful moment that ever happened. I need for you guys to look at this eternal life bill right here. Because the only thing that you can tell somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ that is going to make sense to them is tell them the gospel. That's the only thing that you can do. That's the only thing that will truly work for a person. Because it's the most powerful thing in the universe. And we have this eternal life bill. We all got this bill. And it says right here, item one, all your past sin. Item two, all your current sin. Item three, all of your future sin. The total cost, you are condemned to eternity in hell. That's the total cost. That's the total cost. And as Jesus Christ, he's hanging on the cross, it's like he has this stamp, and he takes this stamp, and he takes this stamp, and he dips this stamp in blood, and, and as he's dying, and he's going through the process of this, he's stamping out all of our sin, past, present, and future. And all this sin that is on here is paid in full. Huh? So when I die, yeah, huh? Amen. 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 That's the joy of the brotherhood of the Christian right there is that I know that when I die, I know that when I die, and if God asks me, why should I let you into my heaven? I can say, because I have faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and I believe he died on the cross and he paid for my sin, and what he did on the cross, it finished it. That's what this is about. This is a memento for tonight. For you guys to take home with you, there's there's stamps that are throughout here, and I want you to stamp each other's pieces of paper and I want you to put this in your Bible or put it in your desk. And I want you to keep this so that this can be a reminder to you that it's paid in full on the cross. It's the biggest moment in history. I go down to, <laughs> amen. It's the biggest moment in history. That's right. This is the big, biggest moment in history. And at that very moment, the veil was torn and you were 100% forgiven of your sin. The sacrifice shows that God... Keep going, guys. What? Yeah, you betcha. Here you go, brother. The sacrifice... This is, this is the second part of verse 25. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back, and he did not punish those who had sinned in times past. He didn't hold them accountable. For he was looking ahead and including them 
and what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight, and when they believe in Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all of your sin, past, present, and future. People who are made right with God when they believe, Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Romans 3.27, we can boast then that what we have done anything that we have to be acceptable to God. No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. Huh? It's based on faith. That's what it's based on. Verse 27 makes it clear that we are justified by faith alone, not by anything we have done. We have faith that when Jesus died on the cross and paid for our sins, that everything past, present, and future was paid in full with Christ's blood. Paul states in verse 28, So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. And just to make sure that we're all sure it's available to everybody, there is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith. There is no other way except by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well, then if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to go away for a little while, and you guys are going to go through some questions. We're going to play a real special song about the veil being torn, and I'll be back up a little bit later. Thank you. Hey. Hey. <laughs>